there is a historic shift of enormous proportions in the relationship between the state of Israel and the diaspora. For the first time since the Second Temple, the shift is decisive in the Jewish world to Israel from the diaspora. But neither Israel nor the diaspora has fully come to terms with this new paradigm. And we need to do so urgently and with great emphasis. The reasons for this historic shift are several. First, pure demographics. There are 13 and a half million Jews in the world. There were 17 million in 1939. Of that, 5.7 live in Israel, 7.5 in the diaspora. But beginning in 2005, more Jews lived in Israel than in the largest diaspora community, the United States, and that divergence will continue and will grow. By 2020, there'll be almost a million more Jews in Israel than in the United States, and by 2030, Israel will be a majority of all Jews in the world. This is a result of several factors, very low birth rates in the diaspora and much higher birth rates in Israel, enormous rates of outmarriage, 40% in Western Europe, 52% in the United States, most without conversions, 75% in countries of the former Soviet Union. As a result, the de demographics and numbers count. Second, Israel is a nation state. It is a sovereign. It acts directly or indirectly in the name of Jews around the world. Unlike diaspora Jews, even in the United States, the most prosperous and politically active community, we can hope to influence our government's policies on Israel compared to other interest groups pressing the other way. And in Europe and Latin America, where communities are much weaker, and much less willing to lobby, the influence is even less. So that is a huge difference to have a Jewish polity acting as a sovereign state and diaspora communities at best trying to influence their government's policies. In addition, Israel has now become one of the key identification points for those Jews who recognize their Judaism. It is a key feature of Jewish identification. For those of us here and who are active in the Jewish enterprise, it is difficult to believe that even in the United States, perhaps 50% of the Jewish community is unidentified, not just with respect to Israel, but with respect to Judaism itself. Most of these Jews are much more concerned with social issues than they are with either Judaism or with the state of Israel. In the 2004 elections, John Kerry, a Democrat, got 75% of the Jewish vote against a president, George W. Bush, viewed by many in Israel as the most pro-Israel president in history. And attachment levels to Israel and to Judaism by young Jews are even lower than for adults. The 2008-2009 financial crisis accelerated this shift by diminishing giving to Jewish organizations, by raising the entry barrier for Jewish day schools, which remain the key antidote to assimilation. The nature of this change is important to understand because with Jewish identification, comes identification with Israel. And for much of Israel's six decades, it looked to the diaspora for support, financial, political, and moral. And that's it. Now it's time for Israel to look at a endangered diaspora as one that needs to be strengthened as a voice for Israel and as a voice for Judaism. In times of tension, as we have now between the Israeli and American governments, this puts American Jews, and may I say the Jews of Europe and Latin America, in a particular bind, loyalty to their country 
and also strong connections to Israel. I'll get to that more in a minute. But understand, please, that most Jews in the United States hold generally liberal views. Not the leaders necessarily, not the ones that speak, but the people who vote. And their focus is on human rights. It's on tolerance. It's on diversity. It's trying to see Israel as they see the United States without realizing the different realities here. And therefore, we need new policies on both sides. First, with respect to Israel. The most important thing is to begin with the precept that the notion of Israel's mission to encourage Aliyah as its main mission rather than to strengthen the diaspora communities has to change. The main mission needs to be to strengthen the diaspora communities because it's in Israel's interest to do so. The more it does so, the more support it will have. And the good news is that this is now beginning. For example, three years ago, the Jewish agency launched a program with Shlichim, or fellows, initially on 17 American campuses, last year on 35, this year on 50. But there are 100 campuses in the United States with 1,000 Jews or more, and they are hotbeds of anti-Israel feeling, and they are hotbeds of assimilation. These shlichim can serve as a way of giving Israel's viewpoint on issues that are debated, because I can assure you the Palestinians are there, but they can also increase Jewish identification more generally. The Massa program brings now 11,000 American college students for an intensive year in Israel. And of course, birthright has taken 200,000. And studies already have been done on what happens to these birthright kids who are here only for two weeks. Much lower rates of intermarriage, much greater attachment levels to Judaism and to Israel. Even Buenos Aires, where I recently was, has a birthright program, and it, these programs need to be extended to Europe and to Latin America as well. In addition, the government of Israel always has to put its own people's security as its first priority. But wherever possible, it should factor in what I would call a diaspora impact statement on any policies that it takes so that it factors in what impact this will have on the diaspora. We should recognize that when rabbis give orders in Safat, that landlords shouldn't rent to Israeli Jews, when, excuse me, to Palestinians. When we have a situation that, to Israeli Arabs, when we have a situation in which mainstream American Jewish organizations like the New Israel Fund are attacked, when we see radicals burning olive trees, when we see situations in which conversions, even by orthodox rabbis in the United States, are not accepted, when we see illiberal legislation, there are costs to be paid in terms of diaspora support. And that's why I talk about a diaspora impact statement. It is also important to educate Israeli students about the diaspora. And let me close with what our responsibilities are in the diaspora. We must continue to support Israel, recognizing its unique burdens, but we also have to do more. We have to reverse the slow, inexorable decline of our own communities. We are like a corporation with two divisions, a healthy, engaged community with 225,000 Jewish kids going to day school more than ever before, and a community on the other side of equal dimensions that is disengaged, disaffiliated, and threatens the entire enterprise. We need to reach out to intermarried couples and welcome them into our communities. We need to have rabbis who are willing to perform intermarriages if the parents are willing to raise their kids as Jews. We need to launch, as we have done with times of war, an emergency campaign in the United States to raise $2 billion for Jewish education, 
because day school education is the best antidote to assimilation and to subsidize trips and Jewish camps and Jewish youth groups and Jewish professional groups coming over here and meeting with their professionals because seeing is believing. With delegitimization occurring, with the UN vote coming, we need each other, we need to feed off each other's strengths and try to shore up each other's weaknesses. There are not many of us in this world of 6.2 billion. If we fail each other, we will pay a price that can't be replaced. I believe we will not, and that we will recognize the new paradigm in which both of us have a responsibility, but Israel takes upon itself a special and unique responsibility to strengthen Jewish identification in the diaspora, so there will be more Jews to support Israel.